eight device tree talks this week. I know all about it and uh, don't near, need to hear any introductory material. Is there anyone who doesn't know anything about device tree and uh, needs an explanation from A? Or, uh, okay, and, and so this is a pretty small audience and um, I'm, there's no point in my just yakking on and on if uh, people don't know what I'm talking about. So I don't see any reason for people not to interrupt with uh, questions. Um, obviously, I'll cut them short if they're going on for too long, uh, particularly if I'm using acronyms that uh, people are not familiar with, which I have a tendency to do. So uh, there has been a lot of discussion about the uh, device tree. There was a session at the Kernel Summit, which uh, I didn't attend, but which uh, we heard a little summary of from uh, Mark Rutland in his uh, device tree, the disaster so far, uh, presentation yesterday, which I greatly enjoyed. I'm going to take a little bit more optimistic uh, approach and try to talk about the bright future of the device tree. Uh, there's also an excellent introduction, uh, I guess maybe in this same room, by uh, Thomas Pettizzoni. And I will largely not repeat what Thomas said unless someone really uh, is puzzled by what I'm saying. So. I'm coming to device tree from the world of automotive. Uh, in the world of a uh, lot of consumer electronics, uh, devices are kept by the user for a year or two years maybe and traded in. And uh, the, you know, carriers are not always providing kernel updates even if they're available. And uh, phones and tablets now are almost considered uh, consumables by the people that purchase them. A car is not in that situation. A car is a major purchase by somebody. Uh, people expect parts to be available for 10 or 15 years. And I think they will be expecting security patches, even though they won't call them that, probably for that amount of time as well. And the whole concept of updating software in cars as part of regular automotive maintenance is new to the auto industry. And the software uh, production and maintenance model for automotive and other products that are going to be installed for a long time, like maybe security systems or ATMs, all the different traditional uses of embedded, uh, is quite a different model than the tablets and phones that have dominated the, the thoughts of a lot of people in embedded the last few years. So, this is just the beginning of some ideas about how if we have a product we expect to be in the field for 15 years, we might approach the problem of updates and maintenance when we introduce the device tree into the picture. So updates of uh, fielded devices are already pretty hard. I don't think I have to tell anybody and embedded that. I think device tree makes it maybe from some point of view optimistically a little bit better and uh, maybe from another point of view harder. Uh, maybe we can make our life a little bit easier by thinking in advance of what are good practices to make the update task uh, tractable. I'm going to talk a little bit about tools that are imminent and tools that are wanted and a little script that I made to try to help and I'll try to summarize uh, best practices. So, so this, <laughs> this black thing in the upper left hand corner is uh, 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 some text that KDE and Debian have decided to put on my screen that I can't make go away. So just, just ignore that. But the rest of this is a diagram that's nothing, no particular rocket science. It's just kind of a, a state machine for deciding if an update you're trying to push is complete and coherent and uh, makes sense. There's no, nothing particularly brilliant or novel about this. The point is just that the state machine involved in updating a root file system or the kernel or both in a fielded device and making sure that they, they have a correct checksum and perhaps they're signed properly is already kind of complicated and painful. And now potentially with the device tree, we're adding another file that has to be kept in sync with the kernel, or maybe we can update the kernel without the device tree. That's something that's been discussed a, a lot this week already. 
And so, as I mentioned, I'm thinking about this from the point of view of automotive and uh, providing long-term maintenance and support to customers uh, as part of building a kernel uh, and a root file system for them. And so I do believe that cars will be getting security patches and that they may require new device trees. Uh, a lot of people are pushing the idea of device trees as a binary interface between the, you know, it's a contract with user space uh, as with the kernel, the binary interface of the device tree. And so maybe we won't have to uh, update the device tree when we update the kernel with security patches. But well, this black thing is really annoying. But um, point is, is that cars, uh, I think we'll probably want them. I mean, I think that's just practical. I'm not uh, going on a big campaign that we should all look forward to changing out our device trees. But uh, you know, if you're in charge of actually making things work with real products in the field, you find that you do a lot of things that people don't necessarily recommend. So one aspect of cars is uh, they have uh, you know, many processors in them. Um, just an example that occurs to me where I think people will probably end up updating the device tree as well as the kernel is if you look at the uh, uh, battery pack in an electric vehicle, uh, it's extremely complicated charging circuit. The batteries are a very complex system with many microprocessors involved in uh, just measuring the state of the battery, cooling them. Um, and uh, so the battery warranty for a brand new Prius in the United States this year is five years, and that battery will certainly be replaced at the end of five years, and I think the technology and the new battery will be quite different. So this is an example of a case where software is going to need perhaps to be upgraded. Uh, another point with cars, even from the point of view of the so-called infotainment unit console uh, is, and the software in that, is that that will control the uh, climate system. And the climate system in an EV runs directly off the battery. I mean, uh, you're not getting heat from the manifold the way you would in an internally combusted car. So all the driver cr uh, comfort features are taking the same power that's used to run the engine. So besides even security updates, I think we're going to get power updates. Uh, and the features of the kernels that go in as far as power and security are, are always changing. So device trees are supposed to be a hardware description. I think the hardware in cars in the field is actually going to change because of these different dynamics. I think even if people can update the kernel without updating the device tree, their desire to get uh, power and security features will, will maybe cause them to change the hardware description, even if the ABI is stable. And then another point is, to be perfectly honest, if you look at the device trees we have now, there's a lot of configuration information in them already that uh, is not really a hardware description. I mean, something that I've used, for example, is MTD partition tables. No one can tell me that a partition table is a description of hardware. I mean, it, you know, a partition table is kind of sort of a, a description of a real entity on the, on the storage device, but it's not like uh, it's, uh, you know, the ad address of a USB uh, or something like that, I and mean, you can change it. Um, we have pin mux resource and clock stuff in the device tree that we might change. We're selecting boot devices. A lot of this is configuration rather than a hardware description. So anyhow, I think, I think we are going to change the device trees. And actually, this is kind of hard. And why is it hard? Well, one aspect that I referred to a little bit before is that cars have a lot of processors in them. They are really rolling data centers. Uh, if you haven't kept current with this technology, it's really kind of uh, daunting how complicated it is. The new Mercedes S-Class, according to Mercedes, is going to have 200 microprocessors in it this year. That's, that's astonishing to me. 
Um, now, a lot of these are 16-bit microcontrollers that just run a PID loop on the brakes or something like that, and they're not having Linux on them, and they're not going to anytime soon. So they're kind of out of scope for this discussion. But I know for a fact that a lot of the cars, actually, Mercedes is Q and X, not Linux, historically. But I know that a lot of cars are going to ship with more than one processor running Linux in them. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there are cars coming out in 2014 model year that have half a dozen Linux running processors in them. And it may be that only one of them is going to be connected to the internet. Um, so maybe if you're getting that new battery pack, it's getting boards with it, and those boards will have new software on it. But some of these other uh, processors that are part of this data center, this rolling LAN, may need to be updated over the LAN locally uh, by software that's loaded onto the one processor that's accessible from a, a USB drive or from the internet. So the, this procedure uh, is really kind of, um, it's really kind of configuration management of this whole system. I mean, it's almost like enterprise computing in some sense, rather than traditional embedded. Uh, another part about the um, device tree update that I, I think a lot of people are aware of, but that people who haven't made heavy use of the device tree won't have thought about a lot, is that the device tree and the kernel configuration have to be kept in sync. And this is kind of obvious, but if you enable a feature in the device tree and you uh, don't build the driver, then the device is obviously not going to work. But um, this actually can be a little bit tricky. Uh, I've worked on something where you know, a multiplexer or a pin mux or a clock configuration needs to be changed to enable a particular device in the device tree. And so then, in order to use that device, you not only have to build the drivers for that device, you have to build the drivers for the bus it's on. So, uh, and if you do update the kernel and the, and the device tree, the names of some of the parameters may change from kernel to kernel. So it's going to be important, certainly in the future, as a bare minimum, to preserve the information about the configuration and the device tree together that you have. And if you have a uh, compilation of the device tree that relies on a whole bunch of include files, you'll have to save all the include files and all the device tree files and, and the kernel configuration all as kind of sets. And if you have a whole bunch of different products, you're going to have to be very careful that that information is really, really well organized. Speaking from personal experience, which doesn't involve anything like 10 or 15 years, you have to keep pretty good records of this stuff. So uh, this is just a... Uh, people say to show pictures in your talk, so I thought the pictures you'd like to see were screenshots of LKML. But um, this is just an interesting post from somebody named Jason Gunthorpe, who says that he has basically a, uh, a script that checks the kconfig against the device tree. Um, and, and so that sounds like a good idea. And uh, I guess he hasn't published that script, but... You know, that's the kind of example. I'm going to talk a little bit more about tools in a little bit, but I, that's an example of a kind of tool that would really be useful for the community, although it would require a lot of, a lot of maintenance. Um, so <laughs> this is unintentionally under this uh, obscuring black banner. Oh, well. Um, another point about the device tree that was not obvious to me at first is the ease with which one may unintentionally break something that was working. So um, here, this is just an example that uh, Kuhn Kui posted to, uh, I guess, the ARM mailing list. Um, so it's, it's pretty obvious if you go into the node that corresponds to a particular device and you change the parameters, you're changing the behavior of that driver. I don't think anybody's unclear on that. But what's less obvious is your driver is using resources like the pin mux, its uh, regulator voltage, or its clock. And if you 
make some apparently innocent patch to the device tree to enable another device that's using the same resources, you can uh, break your device without thinking that you're changing it. And uh, this was a little bit of an alarming uh, uh, example that Cohen posted where basically he, he pointed, up, pointed out that uh, he had an unsupported device that no one was using, and when he added support for another device, it could basically blow the one device, the other device up, which sounds pretty alarming. So you can easily imagine that your board has some you know, little chip on it that you don't even have a connector to, that you're not even using, or you're gonna give your user a new device tree to turn on some feature that you do support, and you're actually gonna alarm them by having smoke come out of this this other chip. I mean, that, that actually honestly could, could happen. I mean, I had another example where I changed the behavior of a device that we didn't change the driver and therefore we didn't test by changing the device tree and rendered it non-functional without even knowing it. So that's just kind of a word of caution is uh, every time you change these uh, clock, pin box, power supply, and probably some other things, you need to look at the whole device tree to see all what might use those devices. So there, are, there is uh, hope about this. As I said, uh, Mark Rutland's uh, talk yesterday was kind of a, a disaster recovery, but I do think uh, things are getting better. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what we might do to preserve information and do updates with a few more files. Uh, one approach that was posted by Joel Fernandez, uh, presented by him at the California ELC last winter, uh, is the flattened image tree. So the flattened image tree is just a little file that describes, uh, it's a kind of a manifest that can record things like the versions of the device tree, the kernel, and any miscellaneous binary blobs and the cyclic uh, redundancy check sums. So this is uh, really handy. While I might wish that I did a good job of keeping records, this uh, method of building an archive uh, kind of has it all right there. Uh, obviously, you could also use uh, BitBake recipes or an Ando Android-like uh, uh, repo XML manifest as well. But I, you know, some type, of, some type of build system that calls out all the files in one place is great because you know it actually built that way at some point in the past. Um, the other nice thing about the flattened image tree is you have this short little ITS file uh, which has a syntax much like device tree that you can compile with uh, the make image usual tool or, and with the device tree compiler DTC and it creates a single archive that you can use for an update that has all these files in them. Uh, obviously there are other ways to do this but this one is really simple and uh, U-Boot now has a, a facility for handling these uh, flattened image trees and uh, thanks to contributions by Chrome OS, who uses this mechanism, there's now a facility for signing the uh, uh, flattened image tree archives. So uh, as far as solving multiple problems at once about security, uh, about um, you know, doing updates as atomically as possible, <laughs> And as far as uh, preserving all this information, I think this, this approach is actually pretty attractive. So, um, you know, hats off to Google and to TI for uh, making this available. It's something that a lot of people may, may want to look at. Uh, as far as I know, there is no ability to sign device tree blobs uh, absent this uh, flattened image tree. And uh, someone at Google has told me that's really why in part, they've adopted this approach. They want to have everything in the, in the Chromebooks signed. So another uh, as yet unmerged feature in the uh, kernel that uh, seems like it has some appeal for uh, typical embedded problems 
is uh, the implementation of runtime configurability via overlays. This is a contribution from Pantelis Antonio, who's been here this week and who some of you may know. Um, basically, right now, when you compile your uh, device tree, you're making a binary file which is in slash boot or you know, on some uh, uh, auxiliary storage uh, and which is uh, loaded by the bootloader and which is static. And so you can, uh, for example, with a flattened image tree, have a multi-boot almost in the spirit of Grub and, and, and uh, um, load different device trees. But you cannot at boot time with, uh, with U-boot easily, you, you can't change the device tree. I mean, you're, it's, it's a compiled file just like the kernel. And uh, unlike the kernel, the device tree doesn't have modules that load. It's just static. So Pantelis's proposal is in spirit similar to having modules for the device tree, having fragments that can be loaded. So Pantelis created this facility to support the capes that go with the beagle bone, which are these daughter cards that can plug in. So it gives a hot plug or a kind of a power on time configurability of the beagle bone so you can attach different accessories to it. And the beagle bone recognizes its capes by reading an EEPROM uh, when the main controller gets an I2C event corresponding to the uh, attachment of the cape. So clearly, this cape EE prom mile, uh, model is not going to apply to most of embedded. But uh, you know, if you look at the um, changes, well, if you look at the cape manager that Pentelis has uh, created, which uh, you can find links uh, through his, uh, his uh, talk and his uh, paper, which are both online. So these are, uh, these are hyperlinks in my. Uh, in my presentation, all this uh, highlighted text, by the way. Um, and so um, you, know, you can pull his sources and try out this overlay for yourself. And uh, for most use cases, you'll want to change the signal, which causes the kernel to load the fragment. Uh, basically, you take, the, uh, take some patches from Pantelis for the uh, device tree compiler, and you can compile the short little plug-in files that he has several examples of into DTBOs, basically uh, device tree binary object files, which this CAPE manager that's watching for some trigger can then load and basically add to the device tree on a running system. So to me, this, as far as updates go, you could have a strategy similar to UnionFS, if you're familiar with how Nopix works, you get a, a writable file system that the user can um, employ in a system that they're booting from unwritable storage un using a union FS. You could basically have a device tree binary uh, in a, some ROM that you never change, that your golden fail-safe device tree binary, and you could just do updates via these overlays. I haven't really thought through whether that's a good strategy, but I would think for some cases, use cases, it might be. And then the third method of adding flexibility to the, um, to the device tree and the kernel that seems kind of appealing was actually, uh, was actually a nice talk yesterday about Zen on ARM. But the whole idea of using um, hypervisors to have collections of bootable images uh, and clearly then, if you try to boot one image and it doesn't come up, you can fall back to the old one. Um, there's some ability here to also to uh, kind of preserve. Uh, you could have a long list of um, sets of files. It's just kind of a, a nice way of collecting information. Um, and of course, there's a lot of ability with hypervisors to have a more secure system and to check signing of binary blobs and things like that. So 
uh, whether or not you find Zen in particular appealing. Uh, a lot of people in automotive are going to hypervisors for security reasons. And uh, you know this is another method maybe of both preserving information and, and managing the large profusion of files we, we now are having. So what are some best practices for making the vice stream more maintainable? Well, one that's uh, been discussed uh, a fair amount at the meeting is uh, the device tree schema and using uh, a validator with a device tree. As a matter of fact, uh, Stephen Warren of NVIDIA has been hard at work and has just posted last night some code for uh, a validator to the mailing list. So uh, the idea is just to, uh, as you can easily do with the web pages, uh, any HTML or XML, you can have a uh, a kind of a DTD description uh, that you can check if your uh, device tree is valid. So I, that could involve, right now the, the device tree compiler just kind of checks if your curly braces match um, or if there are any missing dependencies. It doesn't tell you, as uh, Russell King was just uh, complaining about on the mailing list, whether you've made a typo in the top level board file. The device tree compiler will just, device tree compiler doesn't have the level of checking that you're used to with C files. So there's a pretty large variety of mistakes you can make in it now. Not to mention just bad ideas, but actual mistakes that the compiler won't catch. And so a validator uh, as proposed by Perron and Kusan uh, would catch a lot more mistakes. Um, I think we have a lot of opportunity with the validator. I was talking to Mark Rutland about this yesterday, but the validator could use a tree of schemata, I think the plural is, schema is Greek. Um, and so we could have separate schemas, schemata, for different parts of the tree. And this would just be a way to make the burden of the maintainers who are reviewing device trees and the bindings uh, a lot less because they could just run the validator. It would allow people who are submitting upstream to make sure that they're kind of in keeping with the recommended device tree coding style. Um, and it's an opportunity for the for the leaders of the various subsystems to express to the people who are creating device trees really what's acceptable in a way that is difficult now. And so if you did have a tree of schemata, then you might want to have the validator compile all of them into one top level schema and compare that against your top level device tree source. I was going to make a diagram of this to make it clear what I'm talking about. But basically, the validator would be enforcing the inheritance that's essentially going on in the device tree. Uh, there was a brief discussion on the mailing list about using XML as a schema language, which I was kind of surprised about. Uh, lots of people like James Bottomley said good things about it. To me, that doesn't really make any sense just because when I first looked at device tree, I was struck at how much like JSON it looks like. JavaScript object notation, for those of you who have not heard of it. As a matter of fact, I thought it was JSON. Um, this is just a little fragment of uh, JSON right here, and you can see it's you know, key value pairs terminated with semicolons inside curly braces in a list format. Really, there is some question as to whether uh, to describe properties in key value pairs in a tree, we need to create a new domain specific language for the device tree. So the advantage of taking over JSON is that there's a huge, huge, huge number of visualization, validation tools. Um, the device tree has, you know, it's been around for years now. It's got international language support. There are tools for it in C, C++. And the design of JSON, what its intention was to be a natural representation of data structures for the C family of programming languages. 
That is the problem we're solving. We are solving the problem for which this very popular, stable, uh, well-supported solution exists. So I suspect that the train has already left the station about creating an entirely new tree structure format for device tree. But certainly rather than pick XML, I would pick JSON, the fat-free alternative to XML, as its creator, uh, Douglas Crockford, has, has called it. So um, just one more thing that's kind of a pet peeve of mine is uh, what I would call uh, premature optimization in the device tree. That is, if you think of the device tree include files as themselves a tree, there's no reason in the bottom level file to make choices that can potentially break some of the top level choices that you might make. In other words, if you, you know, if you have a OMAP3, then OK, you're, that's the fundamental choice for your platform. And I don't have any problem with saying OK, turning on the OMAP3 in your lowest level include file. But if you have some peripherals that uh, have resource conflicts with other peripherals, and you only have them on some of your boards, please don't enable that peripheral in the bottom level file. Please enable it in the topmost file uh, where you know that you actually have that device and want to use it. Um, it's just the idea that when you have a, a, a nested hierarchy of include files, you want to use that uh, structure wisely and not put choices in the bottommost files that are liable to create conflicts at the top. In particular, when you have a lot of these files and there's a choice that's bad for you in them, sometimes it takes a while just to figure out where it is. So um, the uh, OK chosen and config on boot file uh, options, those properties in the device tree nodes are, are configuration. They are choices, and unless there's really a good reason, like we're talking about the processor for the board, um, I would not put those in the bottom level of the hierarchy. It's just liable to lead to trouble later on. So this is just a general argument about, um, about uh, level separation, essentially. If you're going to have a board DTS file and a CPU DTS file, you know, don't be putting choices about the data storage and the CPU one. And it is better to think of it, those files that way, and uh, the, hopefully the validator may help enforce some of that good practice in the future. So a lot of the pain about device tree is related to tools in that the DTC device tree compiler is, is a kind, of a, kind of new and not that featureful. It doesn't, for example, have a verbose mode. Um, the problems I alluded to earlier of do my kernel configuration and my device tree um, enumerations match? There's no real tool to answer that. Um, there's no real tool to do the reverse problem of, gosh, I have this um, binary that I like and that I want to change one thing in. How, you know, which of my 40 device tree source files do I compile to produce this? So that's why I suggested that we might want to use some of these manifests or recipes to preserve that information. Uh, on a booted system, we have no tool that reads slash proc to tell you what's in your device tree in case you wanted to know. Uh, maybe if the device tree is really going to be an a ABI, we can uh, have that information in slash boot uh, in a, a zip file like we have config.gz, uh, there is a, an option, which is not in the def config for most arches, of exporting the device tree information to slash proc, but that's not on by default. So it would be great if we had you know, visualization tools. And eventually, we will need, I think, uh, some type of facility for signing device tree blobs, which are, which are not appended to the kernel although that is at least a simple solution. 
So um, the tool that I've made for myself, because it solves an actual problem I have, is uh, a script called uh, Make DTS. This is just uh, a bash script that runs the C preprocessor and runs the device tree compiler and produces source output just so you can read it and kind of get a sanity check. Um, given the structure of the device tree, if you make a mistake and your node gets in at the wrong level, usually when you look at the source, it's, uh, it's pretty evident. Um, so that, uh, that script is, uh, this is just an example of it running. It produces an output file. This is x86 because I don't have the cross com um, compilation tool chain on there. But this is, so this is the uh, result of processing maybe, you know, sometimes 10 um, device tree source files and uh, outputting it into one ASCII file that you can then read. Um, so it, you know, it resolves macros and compiles all the files together. There is a, a program called FDT, Flatten Device Tree Dump, that's in scripts in the kernel source directory. And that produces output much like that. But in that tool, these strings all come out as hex. And I find reading ASCII characters uh, a uh, little bit easier, especially when things are broken and I'm not sure what's wrong than, than reading hex. So this script is, um, this is up at um, my website, shedevel.com. Uh, my slides are also there. Uh, my slide, an older version of my slides without all these hyperlinks in it is at the Linux Foundation webpage. It's also at slideshare.net. So. Um, anyhow, this stuff is, is all, uh, all there if somebody wants it. It would be great if... I also posted this to the mailing list. So this is a, it's a little bit, got a little bit more in it than this. This is a pretty humble thing, but it's, it's useful, I think. It's useful to me for debugging. So uh, I got about two minutes left. Um, it's really important for long-term maintenance to preserve the set of information of all the different systems, uh, all the different files that go into your build system. And uh, this requires maybe a little bit more thought and care now that we have the device trees. Just one more thing. I think this uh, flattened image tree with a single archive for updates is really appealing. And its ability to uh, have every component signed and checksum is really a plus. Uh, and that's now part of U-Boot, at least. Uh, the validator and maybe some other simple things like a verbose mode for the device tree compiler would really make life a lot easier. Uh, I, you can make your own life easier by having good practices regarding uh, level separation and soon validation in the device tree. Uh, the overlays and maybe a hypervisor are appealing as uh, safe ways to approach updates. And so device tree, uh, according to uh, Mark and many others, has been a disaster so far. And I think it has caused a lot of people pain. And maybe the worst doesn't quite over yet. But on the other hand, the whole concept of separating the detailed description of hardware from the abstract interface definition and the description of the methods that are used on the hardware is a good idea. I mean, that's a generally accepted, widely agreed software engineering practice. And so now we're finally abstracting the definition of the devices away from their configuration. And that, that's a good idea. So while the uh, Beginning of the device tree has been ugly. I, that's just because adding new features is always hard. And uh, I think the, in the end, uh, maybe in the imminent future, the device tree will actually end up saving work and making life easier, even though its promise to do that has not yet been uh, fulfilled. So uh, 
maybe we have uh, the disaster so far, but the, uh, the happier future ahead. So with that, I've uh, just about run out my time. Uh, if anybody uh, has any questions, please speak up. So uh, they tell me that uh, either you can speak into the microphone or I'll repeat your question. It looks like it'd be easier for me to repeat your question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my email plan is agreed with you. Uh, but uh, so I'm happy to hear that people are thinking about it and the, the future is bright, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and I agree with most of your uh, of your thesis. There's one thing I'd like to challenge because you sort of dismiss the idea of a firmware, whatever it means, put louder, of uh, modifying the uh, device tree in case when the hardware is changing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, uh, on its own. And that's the, that's the one thing I'd like to challenge because A, device tree, platinum device tree is a direct descent, the, it's a, <coughs> comes from the area of the open firmware power architecture, where by definition the uh, device tree was actually constructed in runtime by firmware based on the real time configuration hardware. And uh, the other thing is that the, it's actually very easy to modify the firmware. And even bootloader tech like you arguing this today, just using the lib. FDT. So uh, it is definitely an option. So in case of your changing, because in one of the cases we'll have to update the device tree because the hardware has changed. And that's per I'm perfectly fine with this. The device tree by definition is a description of the hardware. If the hardware changes, obviously you have to change the device tree as well, right? But uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a, uh, it has to be somehow de dealt with by the kernel, or it doesn't necessarily mean that you will have to update the device tree block which is there, it can be modified by firmware. Moreover, if the hardware by definition can change, maybe firmware should generate the device tree in the first place. So the question is, what about uh, some alternate methods of updating the device tree blob, uh, perhaps via firmware? Uh, there also was a very uh, nice presentation yesterday, I thought by Darren Hart, talking about ACPI. Um, kind of managed to convince me that that may be a viable alternative to device tree. Uh, for the most part, we just want things that work and are uh, maintainable and stable. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I, I confess, I, I don't really know how the uh, power architecture and the Spark have generated their, using the open firmware, of their device trees from the actual hardware. I'm aware that they do that. But sure, yeah, I mean, if there's a way of uh, uh, easily extending that to other architectures, you know, that maybe that's the way to go. Um, I do think it's pretty clear from the state of these things that we don't have it all figured out yet and that people have to have open minds going forward. So does anyone else have any, have any questions or any uh, violent objections or... Uh, Yes. The remark regarding using a JSON for the schema, or maybe the next device tree syntax, is that in JSON you can't have comments. <coughs> and, uh, so maybe it won't be as useful, or you, you'd need to modify the JSON uh, to deviate from the JSON standard. Uh, uh, so the uh, remark was that there are no comments in JSON, uh, and so we'd have to deviate from the JSON standard if we wanted to have comments in the device tree, which I think everyone agree is probably a good idea. Yeah, I mean, I suppose the device tree might want to modify JSON. Uh, if anybody really took a hard look at using JSON as opposed to creating a new domain-specific tree description language, but, uh, you know, JSON is, has a plug-in model and things like that. JSON is already diverse and has all kinds of um, all kinds of files in it. So I don't know. The question is, would that be easier and better in the long term? It certainly, I mean, the great thing about JSON is uh, we'd uh, get uh, all these visualization and validation tools for free yeah. if we used it. So that would be nice. If you modify the syntax, you, you're not getting it for free anymore. Fair enough. I mean, the comment was that we're not getting it for free if we have to change anything. But we're, we're at a moment when we're sort of contemplating changing things anyhow. So that's why it's worth, worth broaching the possibility 
um, just because the changes wouldn't be very large. I mean, it really is extremely similar. Um, but yeah, may, may, maybe it wouldn't be worth it, or maybe we want to go. It seems like the idea of using XML hasn't exactly caught fire, but I, I think there's general agreement that adopting one of these other choices wouldn't be ridiculous. Um, anybody else ha have any? Uh, yes. Device with, I'm sorry? Configuration. configuration. Configuration, oh yes. So the question is if device configuration shouldn't go in the device tree, where should it go? Um, and that's, uh, that's something that was discussed a little bit at Mark's talk yesterday. Uh, the way I look at this from the embedded perspective is, well, we don't want device configuration in board files, and we don't want it in device tree. It's just clear they don't want it. The people who are real software purists are like, we hate this hardware. It's so messy. Just get rid of it. We'll just run everything on some glorious virtual machine without hardware, you know. What was this thing? Uh, thank you. Uh, that um, uh, Mark showed yesterday, you know, Linux dummy vert. Let's just run everything in Linux dummy vert because we hate all this stupid hardware configuration. It's we're just bad it all together, right? So, uh, you know, uh, what, at one point I think there was a proposal on April Fool's Day to get rid of slash arch, right? <laughs> that's, that's essentially what we're talking about. So, yeah, I mean, uh, wherever we put hardware configuration, the, the grown ups who are in charge of this whole system get annoyed by it. And uh, I, I mean, I guess we end up having some header files, which of course are not board files. They're not board files. No, they're not. And they won't be in the directory where the board files are. But, but yeah, I think everybody basically agrees that somewhere this information, there has to be hardware configuration somewhere. But if the device trees are an EBI, then I guess they can't be in the, the device trees. So um, they have to, the configuration, the message we're getting in all seriousness is that the configuration cannot be in a place where change, where user space or other binary interfaces expect it to be stable. It has to be kept internally to the kernel and not, not exposed uh, in any binary format because otherwise people will depend on it and they, they will be angry when their files stop working. I guess, I guess that's kind of where we are. So that, that seems sensible enough. But, but yeah, there is, there is a question now, where does the configuration go? So does anybody have a, yes? One thing we've done with uh, one of our hypervisors is have just a separate config tree. Uh, so I, I don't see why it couldn't be external to the kernel as long as it's clear that unlike the device tree, you know, this is configuration and this is, not, this is not to be touched by the bootloader. So the comment is uh, that some of the virtualization schemes have an explicit configuration file which no one is supposed to read unless they're the owner of that file and that people are sternly warned is, is uh, not being exported to user, uh, user space and is just the private file of the hypervisor, I guess. Um, and it, Right. So the, the comment is just that if you, you have to be very careful about interdependencies that you're kind of coding in between the bootloader and the firmware and the kernel because then there's really no update scheme that really is going to be robust at all. So I think I'm basically out of time unless someone has one final, final quick question. So thank, thanks very much for coming. <laughs>